Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today uh, for today's Lunch and Learn. My name is Bonnie Yu. I'm an application engineer from MapleSoft. And today I'll be talking about uh, symbolic computation techniques for multi-body systems. Let's begin. So when we create multi-body models, uh, we often generate very large systems of DAES, so differential algebraic equations. These equations can take a significant amount of time to solve numerically. And what that means is uh, often modeler needs to uh, make difficult decisions between model fidelity and the simulation speed. Essentially, they have to make compromises when they build these models. Many of the straightforward benefits of symbolic computation in multi-body models are well known. Um, for example, things like automatic removal of multiplications by ones and zeros, uh, cancellation of common terms, uh, applying trigonometric simplifications, and so on. In this session, I'll be presenting some additional advantages to having access to a symbolic computation engine during the model development and uh, code generation phases by techniques like coordinate selection, symbolic manipulation, and expression optimization. And I'll be showing this using our products Maple and MapleSim. Uh, throughout the Lunch and Learn, I'll also be uh, showing two case studies. The first one will be an inverse kinematics of the Stuart platform. And the second will be a hardware-in-the-loop platform for a planetary rover. Okay, so MapleSim has built-in smarts to select optimal coordinate frames when working with multi-body systems. And this is very important because uh, physical constraints in the system adds complexity to, dif to the differential algebraic equations uh, that represents the system. And this complexity is indicated by an increase in the index of the DAE. Uh, so the index is essentially a count of the number of times that the DAE needs to be differentiated in order to reduce the problem to an ODE, at which point it can be solved using standard differential equation solvers. Differentiation, however, magnifies numeric errors, and therefore multiple differentiations can quickly render results useless unless we apply techniques uh, to reduce these errors. Uh, these techniques are generally useful for up to index 3, so that's very limiting because we can easily produce the AES of uh, index 3 or greater when, when we're doing physical modeling. <coughs> Just as an example, um, I have a simple pendulum on the screen. If we used polar coordinates as our generalized coordinates, we get an ODE. If we use Cartesian coordinates, we get an index 3 DAE. So even this simple pendulum, one link pendulum, resolves to an index 3 if Cartesian coordinates were used. So coordinate selection, as you can see, directly impacts the number and complexity of the resulting equations. Now consider a more complicated, a Stuart platform. So this is basically a six degree of freedom mechanism, uh, which consists of uh, six identical legs holding a platform. Uh, these legs are fixed via the ground using universal joints. And then they're attached to a common platform using uh, spherical joints. The motion of the platform is then controlled by uh, six actuators on the legs, which drive the length of each of the legs. For this mechanism, if we use absolute coordinates, we get 78 coordinates. So 12 per leg, uh, so that's six per uh, rigid body. And then an additional 6 for the platform, so 6 degrees of freedom. We get 78 dynamic equations. The platform has 6 degrees of freedom, so we're left with uh, 72 constraint equations. This gives us a total of 150 equations. If we use hybrid coordinates, this is a combination of absolute and joint coordinates. Uh, we're now left with 24 coordinates. So three per leg, three constraints per leg. So that's two for uh, the universal joint at the base and one for the prismatic joint. So three per leg, 
six still for the platform. We get 24 dynamic equations. Uh, still six degrees of freedom platform, so we get 18 constraint equations. Now we have 42 equations. <coughs> so this is just an example of how um, intelligently selecting coordinates can uh, significantly reduce our number of equations that we're going to work with. One of the things that Maple does uh, as well is uh, code optimization. And one of the techniques it uses is it looks for sub-expressions of an expression, and then it stores them once, referencing them elsewhere in the equation. So this example here is a continuation of the previous, so the Stewart platform. These are the three constraint equations for the mechanism, so our x, y, and z. Uh, Maple will take a look at sub-expressions uh, that will be repeated, things like cos angle, cos beta, so it gets stored as these variables, and then these variables get called, and now the constraint is basically these three, constraint one, two, and three. So not only is this efficient for managing a computer's memory resources, but it also provides significant benefits uh, in the area of generating efficient simulation code. Uh, if we take a look at the computation cost between uh, normal and optimized code, uh, on the graph here on the left, or the y-axis, you see the frequency of which each of these operations um, are performed. And that's a comparison between the normal and our optimized code. Okay. Uh, next, I want to show uh, the example of the Stewart platform in MapleSim. And what I want to uh, extend on is how being able to view these equations, and more importantly, the structure of these equations in Maple can lead to further simplifications. So let me step into our software. Okay, so this is MapleSim. Let me just run the model as I'm uh, describing the model. So on the left, the three blocks are uh, my three inputs. So those are uh, uh, the position of the platform that I want it to be in. Um, I feed it into these six uh, subsystems. They're identical subsystems. They're basically the legs. Inside the legs, mm. there is a an inverse kinematics block. So it takes um, the input that I've specified and it uh, determines the uh, leg length that should be applied for each leg. Okay, so simulation finished. These were the uh, leg forces that were calculated. I'll talk more about that um, after I describe the model. Um, that's just um, a translation position. If I step into this actual leg subsystem, you'll see uh, the formation of the leg. So this is the ground. It's connected through universal joint, two masses, uh, between it a prismatic joint, so that's a one degree of freedom uh, translational joint, and then connecting to the platform, so the other end, a uh, spherical joint. These red blocks here are just for visualization. So if I step back out, each of these legs are then connected to this uh, platform, which is essentially a rigid body, so with a, with mass and inertia. Okay. Um, in the visualization, so we can see this is what's happening, and these motions are uh, completely based on the inputs I've specified for the model. Okay, so that's the model. Uh, what I really wanted to show was uh, behind the scenes, what can be done. So this is a worksheet that was created. In, so this is the Maple environment now. Um, I still see my MapleSim model through this window. This is a, a two-way communication. So if I make any changes on the MapleSim side, I can still see that being reflected in this window here. Um, so these are there are a few API commands that um, we've used here to perform the tasks that we need, basically to make connections and interact with the MapleSim model within my Maple environment. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to link the model. So it's linking the MapleSim model um, onto this worksheet. And then there's a, um, a multi-body tool, which will allow us to obtain different um, multi-body uh, um, specifications of the of the mechanism. So there we go. We have uh, 
six degrees of freedom it's identified. It's modeled using 24 generalized coordinates, as I talked about earlier, and 18 algebraic constraints. Okay. Uh, if I step down, this is where I am uh, basically creating the inverse kinematics block that I just uh, showed you uh, in the model. I'm going to take you through the steps of how we did that. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, look for the symbolic constraint Jacobian. Uh, this is one of the commands in the, the multi-body library. It returns the symbolic constraint Jacobian, which is the partial derivative of the constraint equations with respect to the modeling coordinates. So you can see we generated automatically uh, the symbolic equations for this. So that's great, but uh, it's not too meaningful for me until I can um, do something with these equations. So I'm going to go and browse this. That's going to let me inspect the structure of these equations. Um, tabular form will allow me to, it's put into the structure, um, all the new, uh, symbolics are still there. If I actually step over to image, this will give me a very clear um, view of the structure of the system. So let me begin by describing what's going on here. The white squares here correspond to uh, a symbolically zero term. So that's uh, zero for all time, not just a single instance in time. And then the black squares correspond to any potentially non-zero terms. Okay. And then the two vertical black columns we see, these correspond to the platform's three uh, translational and rotational coordinates, respectively. Uh, and clearly we can see that these coordinates are involved in all of the constraint equations. So this is the list of constraint equations. Um, and they're involved in every single one of them. However, as a direct result of using these uh, previously mentioned hybrid coordinate selection, the joint coordinates for each leg only appear in, in a cluster of three equations. So that's these clusters here. So those are the constraints related to the XYZ constraint of each leg's uh, spherical joint. Okay. Now, closest, if we take a look at these constraints and symbolically compare them, we can quickly confirm that the parameterized constraints of these six groups are actually symbolically identical. Let me scroll down here. Okay, so I generated those uh, constraint equations. I'm going to take a look at uh, leg one. So that's uh, so pu it's put into a vector. So I'm just indexing. So this is uh, leg one and then leg two. I'm going to um, substitute um, names and then basically calculate the difference and then uh, symbolically simplify it. So I'm going to run this. Let me show the results. And it gives me that it's zero, which means that it is sub symbolically identical. Now, if we assume that the uh, the level the platform is level, and we generalize our parameter names, and then lastly simplify our constraints, so this is just some intermediate steps here. We can take a look at uh, the solving order of these equations. So the order that we should solve these equations in. So you can see that uh, clearly we should solve for equation 2 first for alpha, and then beta in the third equation, and then s, which is my position of each leg in the first equation. So that's the order that I'm going to apply, uh, my solve command. OK, and there we have my three equations. This basically makes up my inverse kinematics block. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and create that inverse kinematics block. So once we have equations, um, we have templates for creating, uh, applying these equations and applying and generating MapleSim components. So basically pushing these equations back out to create a, compo a physical component that we can use. So first thing I'm going to do is define the parameters. I'm going to define my uh, ports, so inputs and outputs in this case. And then I'm going to generate the Modelica code for it. So make, I'm using Maple to Modelica. Let me just show that. OK, so generated uh, the code for those equations automatically. And then I use my set component command. I saved the Modelica code in the above here as, as Modelica. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to create this as a component 
in my worksheet A. Okay, uh, it already existed, so it's asking me if I want to replace it. Uh, and there it shows up, inverse kinematics. So that's the component that's in each of these legs here. Okay, so that was an example to show how we can um, build the model, uh, look at the equations, look at the structure of them, and then start making simplifications in order to solve for inverse kinematics in this case. Uh, one more thing I wanted to show uh, in this example while we're still in the software is uh, the timing associated with uh, creating the, uh, the code for this model. So I just opened up Maple again, uh, a few API commands again. So again, I'm linking my MapleSim model. And I'm uh, using this, uh, this command here, get compiled proc, which basically uh, generates a compiled procedure of the model. And then I just wrapped it around a timer so I can take a look at how long it takes to compile this, this code. Uh, the advantage of this compiled code is, of course, that we only have to pay the cost of compiling once. Once we uh, create this procedure, we can then uh, freely use this uh, to do further analysis. In this case here, I've saved the compiled procedure as name AA. And then I'll also be showing, uh, once we created that compiled procedure, uh, the time it takes to actually run this procedure AA and showing the time difference. Okay, so we can see the time that it took to generate was 46, 47 seconds. And then now I'm going to run this procedure. I'm going to say a simulation time of 7 seconds. So we're going to see how long it takes to run a 7 second simulation. That took 0 0.25 seconds. So extremely quickly because we've already compiled this as a procedure. So now all that's left is doing the integration and actually simulating of that model. So that becomes very useful when we um, do analysis like, like optimization, where we have to run the model uh, thousands of times. Let me step back into my slides. OK, next I want to talk about uh, some of the analysis we can do with models that we create. Uh, first thing, parameter sweep. So this is a um, piezoelectric linear stepper motor created in MapleSense. Uh, in this case, we created the model, uh, we compiled it in Maple, and then we ran parameter sweeps. Uh, the advantage of doing that is that once we compile the procedure, uh, first of all, what compiling the procedure of compiling basically is uh, the equation generation process, uh, doing symbolic simplification, uh, optimization, the coordinate selection, all of those are done um, at that time. So if we compile it once as a procedure, basically we only have to do that once. We only have to pay the, the cost of that once. Then we can run this model, uh, vary the parameters of the model, and just do the integration, not having to redo the, the initial phase. So that's a lot of time savings. So in this graph here, we're varying um, the clamp voltage and looking at the displacement over time. And then in this case, we're varying both the uh, piezo uh, piezo voltage and also the damping voltage. Uh, the next example here is an optimization example. This model here is um, representing a vibrating dance floor. And then, oops, sorry. Back here. Uh, we're saying that there are dancers that are applying forces, uh, so they're dancing, applying forces. Uh, the frequency of their, their step, steps matches the natural frequency of the dance floor. Um, that's causing huge vibration issues. So we're going to add a set of uh, passive uh, mass breaking dampers. Uh, the problem here is what is the optimal spring and damping constant? So we built this model. Again, we bring it into Maple and compile it. Um, with optimization, of course, we have to run the model over and over again. Um, thousands of times. So doing the, that compilation, compilation as a procedure really is a big time saver. So we defined uh, our cost function after we compiled the model into a procedure. 
this time um, we want to basically minimize the uh, position or the vibration. We take advantage of um, one of Maple's many packages, so optimization. So we use that function, uh, the nonlinear simplex, and it gives us my optimal spring and damping constant, which I can then push back out into my model to obtain my result. So we could see the before and the after. Okay, now uh, the last thing I'm going to show is a case study. This is a hardware in the loop platform uh, that's for planetary rovers. The objective of this is to design a modular test platform to allow system level testing of planetary rover components before a complete prototype is available. Um, this allows for hardware to be added progressively into the simulation loop as they become available. So <coughs> the main advantage of that is basically uh, designers will be able to get a system level view uh, before all the components are readily available or actually start doing testing with them to get more and more accurate results before every component of a system is available. So whatever is available will be um, in the hardware setup. Whatever is not available, they will have a model of it. So the hardware and the software is uh, communicating together in this, this test platform. OK, so to begin, uh, what's involved in this uh, model? There's terrain information. Uh, so that includes mission start and end points, uh, the elevation of the, the ground, uh, surface conditions, and obstacles. This gets fed into a path planning module um, to essentially avoid obstacles, to minimize either travel distance or energy consumption, and it also uh, works to avoid excessive tilt of the rover. That information is brought into the um, uh, the actual dynamic rover model. So that consists of the rover dynamics with the suspension, uh, tire models, and also powertrain components. Uh, this is going to be brought into, uh, well, it's going to be combined to create a software component library. There's also a hardware library, and then there's a, a test setup uh, for each of the component testing as well as system testing. In terms of the components, first thing we have is a rocker bogey suspension. Uh, we have the wheels, uh, solar panels, the individual wheel motors, uh, battery pack, uh, heaters, robotic arms and other instrumentation, and of course the terrain, the environment, which in our case was uh, only temperature. So this is the um, six-wheeled rocker bogey rover model, the dynamic model. In the middle, we have the rover body. On the two sides, we uh, attach to it our revolute joint, so that's one degree of freedom um, rotational. That's connected to um, the, the bogey. On the two ends of the bogey, one end is uh, attached to uh, the first tire, first wheel. The second is attached to uh, the rocker. And then on both sides of the rocker um, are the two remaining wheels. And then the same on the left-hand side. And then there's a differential coupling, which is uh, essentially an algebraic coupling between the two. So if um, the right side goes up by 30 degrees, the left goes down by 30 degrees. <laughs> on top of that, we created a uh, steering command component, which takes in the steering angle as an input, and also angular velocity. And that's the visualization environment in Mapleson. Uh, if we take a look at just a screenshot of it, uh, this is the model, and you can see these are all custom components that were created for the model. So essentially, we are left with a custom component library for this, this rover model. The same thing um, also applies for the powertrain side, so we have, uh, instead of joints and tires, uh, components like uh, solar panels, battery packs. So we have a component library for that as well. This is um, a video of the resulting model. So the first one was a simple test going through a bump, and then now we placed it on more uneven terrain.
Okay, now that was the software side. Um, taking a look at the hardware components, we have the lighting system and um, the solar arrays. Now assembly with a battery pack, the motor, and then a flywheel to simulate the um, inertia of the rover. And then we have an additional load simulator that's going to be uh, uh, simulating a lump of um, auxiliary loads, so things like heaters, the robotic arm, instrumentation, and so on. And that's everything is communicating with National Instruments uh, PXI. So we have all of our models done in MapleSim. Uh, the hardware is set up on the test bench. The models are all um, exported out to LabVIEW, where we created a test program. And so uh, the two are communicating via the National Instruments PXI. This is just a screenshot of the uh, user interface of the test. Uh, so each of the components, we can see the um, current operation. If we click on the parameters tab, we can also change these parameters in real time. So these would be if, if we have a software simulation of that component. Mm -hmm. uh, so using Maple and MapleSim was crucial to, to this project because it was able to create high fidelity models um, that was still able to run in real time, which of course in this case, or any hardware in the loop um, testing is crucial. And just to present some of the results, uh, we're comparing uh, pure hardware versus um, this hardware in the loop testing. And we're looking at three things, the power generated, uh, the power consumed, and the state of charge. So power generated is the line in red. So you can see that uh, sort of resembles um, the available sun hours we would have, the radiation. And then oh, in blue is the load, uh, load curve. And then in black is our battery state of charge. We also ran this for winter conditions. So you can see that in the winter, uh, there's a lot less power generation uh, from the red curve here. And you can see this time the battery state of charge is getting to a very low um, level. Uh, so at this point, a designer would um, say, OK, well, in the winter, because we have less power generation, we're going to have to significantly reduce our, our tasks. Um, so we're going to change that uh, power consumption or the load curve. And then you can see the, the resulting battery state of charge. OK. So just as a quick summary, uh, using symbolic computation techniques, multi-body models can be effectively pre-processed. The ability to view and manipulate the system equations and their structure uh, can lead to further simplification. Using symbolic equations and compiled code, uh, we can effectively perform a system analysis. So those are the examples I showed with the uh, parameter sweep and optimization. And we can also automatically generate code, uh, which is optimized for real-time deployments. 